welcome to Books Unbound, the podcast where we unbind books to get to their hearts with your hosts, us. It's Ariel and Raylene. Hello. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> so for you guys, it's been, this is the weekly update. The episodes have been coming out beautifully, <laughs> if, if we do say so ourselves. Uh-huh. <laughs> but for us, it's been two weeks since we last recorded. Mm-hmm. And what this means is that we have a lot to say. <laughs> This is our time to talk. So much has happened, um, including daylight savings, which I only bring up because the sun is in my eyes and there's nothing I can currently do about it. So together, if you're on the video version, the sun will slowly move and it should be fine soon. Um, but yeah, if I'm kind of leaning over, that's that's why. Just we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about, Raylene. A lot yeah. Of- a lot of bookish commotion has gone down for us. <laughs> yeah, we both did like booky booky things in the past week yeah. or so. so yeah, we had booky times. Um, but let us begin with some very important news, which is that our bookmark subscription club is currently open mm. for subscribing. So this is one of our mainstay projects that we do throughout the year. We did it last year. We were so happy with how it went. We did it last year. It has gone wonderfully. And so we're doing it again next year. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, we have this quarterly bookmark subscription where we team up with artists that we really, really like. We like spend weeks looking for artists, Mm -hmm. cool people, and then we reach out to them and they design two beautiful bookmarks for us. So you can only get the bookmarks through the subscription. They're not for sale individually afterwards. Um, So this is the only way to make sure that you get them. And they come out and they just get mailed to you four times a year. Every few months, you get these beautiful bookmarks and a set of, um, yeah, so you get the set of bookmarks, a sticker. um, Actually, you get two stickers. Two stickers. um, Two stickers, a set of stickers, and a little video from us uh, saying, you know, hola, this is a book we recommend you read (laughs) with these bookmarks. Yes. It's a cute little package. It's only, what is it, $11.50? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. American, so whatever that is in your currency that you're listening. But, like, it's really honestly surprisingly cheap, I think, for what you're getting. And Mm -hmm. it is such an amazing way to support the podcast because that ongoing support we so are so grateful for. So yeah. it's projects like this that have led us like to continue investing in the podcast and doing video and stuff like that. So yeah. if you want to check it out, it's available now. And we just got, literally before we hit record, we just got some of the artwork mm. from one of the artists and we were fanning over it. It's so good. Um, it's so, I think that that might be like my favorite bookmark of all of the bookmarks Oh, yeah. I know. It's going to be nice. <laughs> I said it. High praise. Um, so if you want to check that out, you can check out the link in our show notes or in the description if you're on the video version, but it will also be linked on our Instagram. And you can just go to our website, booksunboundpodcast.com and go and there's a giant shop button. <laughs> yeah. And you can just click that and it will take you to the shop. So there's lots of ways to get to that. But the thing about the subscription model is that this is the only time that you can sign up. Sign ups yeah. close on November 20th and then they're closed for the whole year because of the way that we have to order everything. So yeah. do it now. Do it now. Damn and it. just so for people who might be wondering if you're already yeah. signed up, you will still be subscribed to the club. So you don't have yes. to like re-sign up. Yes. Good catch because we did get questions yes. about that. You don't have to do anything. It'll just keep on going, which is great. <laughs> yep. All right. That is checked off of my list. Next thing that we have to talk about. you I don't know if you remember this, Raylene. You sent me on a little mission. I actually sent myself on a little mission, actually, now uh-huh. that I think back uh-huh. on it. Last week, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about. but we, Oh, it was the episode where we were rating things out of 10. Yeah. And we were talking about sprayed edges. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And you asked me, why do some older books only have, like, yeah. one edge sprayed? Yeah. And I was like, you know what? That's going to be, like, my book binding um, deep dive. Like, I'm going to try and figure out the answer yeah. for us. When I tell you that I spent hours of research on this, <laughs> oh, I went down. It was such a rabbit hole. Like it was the rabbitiest hopping rabbit hole yeah. ever. 
It was so fascinating. There was, I learned so much. <laughs> I had so much fun, like l trying to figure out the end. I honestly felt like, did I just discover what I should do a PhD in? Because there's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's so much about the book history of it all that like goes into this. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try and give you a truncated answer here because, okay. like, like I said, there, there's too much to go into. But I will say. Um, I'll link to some of my favorite spots that I found that like yeah. little articles that I read where I was like, this is so fascinating. I'll link those down if you guys want to go down this rabbit hole with me. <laughs> There's a lot of different reasons here. Okay. So the okay. first thing that we're, all, I'm so excited to tell you guys these things because this is fascinating. It all goes back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm already going on a whole rant. <laughs> it all goes back to, um, medieval books. Of course it does. So basically I learned about how so many of our current expectations are not what people, like not how books functioned a long time ago. Yeah. So let me actually, I'll pick up this random book here that I'm not even going to be talking about in this episode, but it's just the nearest biggish book to me. So, um, and I will explain this for our audio listeners. Obviously we have the book spine. Mm -hmm. The pages that are exposed on the other side, the opposite side, the long side of pages. Yeah. I have learned is called the four edge, mm -hmm. F O R E, the four edge. Okay. The pages at the top section, that's the top edge and then the bottom edge. Okay. Makes sense. So, when books were originally made, they didn't use the spines for information. Oh. Which we now put the title and the descript or the the author on yeah, there. Yeah. That was not a default thing. That's weird. And my a bit of research that I did there was, I think that it was just like a combination of A, the material that they used was yeah. not like a material you would write on. But secondly, they just didn't have that many books. And so you didn't need to title them. Yeah. It's like, do you, do you title your tables? No, you just know that that <laughs> table is that, right? Like you don't, it's, you don't have that many because books were so rare. And yeah. so this concept of a title is a, is a, a later establishment. The second thing I learned is that books were not kept on bookshelves with the spines out. What on earth? And they were not standing upright. No. They would be laying flat with the fore edge out. Oh my goodness. Okay. So all of these reasons changed what their concept of doing stuff on the page edges right. was all about. And so one of the things that they do is that they would do four edge paintings. They mm -hmm. paint on the sides and that would have been to help identify them, to so make cool. them more ornate, make them more beautiful. As time passes, the history of books is passing and books are becoming more and more, like we're getting more books, they're, they're making more books. A couple of things happened. Number one, because they had more, they did start standing them on their sides yeah. in order to cram more in. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because they had more, they needed to identify them better. And so they started putting the title or the spine side out and they started putting titles and stuff there. Yeah. So that it, that it was one rabbit hole that I went down that I was like, <laughs> this is so fascinating. The reason that this relates is because the be, once books spun out, now the pages <laughs> were just for fun. Yeah, yeah. And so fun stuff started happening there as well. Like like complicated paintings or invisible paintings where you would like when you fan the oh, pages a yeah. certain way, a painting is exposed and the, the it could become more ornate. So one of the things that started happening as well was gilding. They would obviously, or gilting or whatever, they would put gold foil yeah, on the edges. Yeah. And the reason for this was A, decoration, but B, to protect the pages uh -huh. from dust and from other like mites and stuff like that. What's fascinating is it was in this conversion from a laying down book mm -hmm. where it would have, it could have been dusted or there would have been wind to a time when their book now was standing upright and only the oh. top edge was exposed, <laughs> that that was the only one they really needed to protect from dust. I see. And so the thing happened where they started only spraying the top edge hmm. in order to protect it from dust. And then it just became a pretty thing that we did. Yeah. And we just did it for aesthetics. Huh. There you go, Raylene. That is what Thank I learned. Thank you.
Thank you, Teacher Ariel. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> now we it know. was so fun. It was so fun to go down this rabbit hole. And when I tell you that I saw a million other things to mention and that I have simplified the hell out of that, and then I know there are going to be medievalists listening to this who are like, it wasn't exactly like that. You're right. It wasn't. It was. That's an approximation yeah. of a lot of history of books. Um, okay. The final update that I needed to tell you about was that this is my new favorite pencil. I was going to say, you and your pencil, <laughs> you've been waving that thing around. <laughs> so I was reading a book and suddenly the idea of using colored pen to annotate seemed insane to me, mm, which yeah. is so funny because that has been the default thing I've been doing for the last decade. Yeah. So I don't know why suddenly I was like, what the hell am I doing? It needs to be a why pencil. Why would I do that? I was like, it needs to be a pencil. So I went into my parents' room because I knew my dad had pencils there. And so I took one of his pencils. And now <laughs> I can't live without my pencil. This is my favorite pencil. I use it for pointing, enunciating, <laughs> um, and for, of course, annotating. There annotating with a pencil, it's a completely different game. Completely different game. And I really like this game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good game. Where did I get this pencil? Um, I remember I bought a bunch of these for my dad for carpentry projects at Dollarama. No. Oh. So it is not okay. a fancy pencil. It's just a great pencil. <laughs> I love it. What's going on with you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not much. <laughs> I haven't discovered a new pencil or gone down any crazy rabbit holes, but mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in the past week, or I guess like week and a half, there was another book sale near me. So I went to that. Um, Hell yeah, it tell was us going about on, that. Yeah, so it was going on for a week um, and I went to it twice because I went on the first day when it opened, like right when it opened and it was mayhem. There were so Ooh. many people and so many books and like so many books stacked underneath tables that it was just impossible to look at everything because it was yeah. so crazy. But I did manage to get a large stack of books, mostly not for myself, mostly their yes. Christmas presents, which was I found some really great books to give yeah. to my friends and family. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but I did find a couple of books for myself. So when we get to the book haul portion, I can kind of talk about that. Um, I mean, maybe we should just transition into the yeah, book haul now. Yeah, me as well. I mean, mine is good. Yeah, it's a pretty flow. small, pretty small haul. Um, so I just found a couple of books, and but very exciting books. So yeah. the first one I found was Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe mm. by Fanny yes. Flagg, which I can't remember if we talked about this on the podcast or if we, we were did. just chatting about it. But No, no, we did because it was one of the ones I was going to get you for the two, I think it was for right. the 200th episode. Right. We were like, we had to get a book that had something to do with one of the episodes. And oh, right. I picked that one. I wanted to pick that one because I was trying to find a book where old ladies talk on a porch because that <laughs> right. was like a dream we had in one of the episodes. Yes. But when we're 80, yes. we'll hang out and be on a porch. And that was the one I could find that was the closest to it. Yeah. But I, they weren't best friends. They, it was oh. like one lady's older than the other one. So I, I ended up not grabbing it for I that. See. But I still like really think it sounds great. Yeah, it says on the back, it's the story of two women in the 1980s of gray-headed Mrs. Threadgood telling her life story to Evelyn, who was the sad slump, oh, in the sad slump of middle age. <laughs> <laughs> a sad slump. A sad slump. Um, so yeah, what was really fun about this too is that I actually found multiple copies of it. So I bought one for Ariel too. So Yahoo! that's a little uh, spoiler to Christmas, but I had to ask <laughs> you because I couldn't remember if you had it or not or if you yeah. even wanted it. So that was a really good find. Um, it's also about a cafe, which as we know, like I, I love people talking about making food and stuff. So I'm hoping yes, that that'll be true. a big part of it. But anyway, so the only other book I actually got at the sale is intensity by dean Kuntz, which mm. is the randomest book of all time i think for me to have picked up or at least on the surface it seems totally random um but this is a book that i read a review for like a decade ago and decided i wanted to read it but i just never like bought it and never really like dedicated myself to like oh yeah i'll actually read it soon or whatever and then when i was at the book sale i was just like you know what if they have it i'll pick it up like today's the day. I don't know. I just decided that today was the day. Love and so I, I did pick that. it up and I'm actually reading it now. So I'll talk about that later. But this book is like a horror thriller. Never read a Dean Koontz book before. So 
I don't know. It's just totally random. But I, yeah, so I picked those up, but then I also got a call from my local bookstore that they had found a book for me, I'm assuming at the book sale, because they were also at the book sale. I saw them there. I know what they were up to. <laughs> and they found for me Neuromancer by William Gibson, oh, which is a book I don't know that much about, honestly, but it's I like a one. sci-fi classic that yeah, yeah. has kind of shaped the genre a little bit. Like it's one of those books that helped make sci-fi what it is today and it's kind of more about like cyberspace and stuff like that i think but i really don't yeah. know that much about it i i want to go read into the it first not line too much what was that have have you read the first line no what's the first it's line? incredible okay, it's let me incredible read it. let me read it to the class <laughs> the sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel oh that is good mm, that's Ugh. so that's incredible good. I okay. know! <laughs> that makes me extra excited to read this. Dang, that's good. That's real good. So those are the books that I got from the sale and my local used bookstore. But you and I were also sent a book by Bloomsbury yes. that is very yes. exciting that we can chat about quickly. And that is Welcome to the Hunam Dong Bookshop by Huang Bo Ryum. And this is so exciting. Not only is it just like a very, very beautiful cover, like this is an art it's that we got. So this comes out in February great. of this upcoming year, um, but it fits into our vibe completely. So oh, the main character is a woman, ever. you know, she works mm. a job and she's burnt out. She wants to escape her life of whatever job she's working and she goes to work in a bookstore slash buys a bookstore. I'm not really sure of all the details, Incredible. but yep. it just looks fantastic. And in, on the cover, it looks like it's like a nighttime bookshop. So I don't know if that's just for aesthetics or if that's the truth, but I feel like that yeah. would be really cool. Um, yeah, and it's a South Korean book translated by, let's see who it's translated by. Oh, it's right here. Shanna Tan, translated by cool. Shanna Tan. So this is pretty exciting. I haven't read a book set in a bookshop in quite a long time. So I'm very oh, picky. Yeah, I'm quite picky about those. So I'm excited about this one. Look how interesting this is. Shanatan, it says on the back, Shanatan is a Singaporean translator. Um, it talks more about her life, but then it says she was mentored by Anton Her. Oh. He's like a really, uh, I follow him on Instagram. He's like a really popular translator. He did Curse Bunny. But oh that, yes 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 like i was like the name of, sounds familiar for sure yeah he's done a lot of big that's interesting that like he is such an established translator that if you are a mentoree of his they'll put that in your bio yeah no kidding <laughs> that is awesome i'm also flipping through the 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 chapters have titles and one the second chapter is called it's okay to stop crying <laughs> I love it. You know, it's funny. I've actually so said exciting. this to people before, like in October is kind of like the time to read and watch scary movies. And mm -hmm. I've said November is the month to cry. Like, I don't know why, but I you feel like November is me. the sad month because like Christmas is all about joy and happiness. So I feel like you go yeah. from spooks to happiness. There's got to be something in between. And it's just like a sad, rainy, that's crying so month. Funny. So it's that's so perfect. Funny. Maybe I should read this really book in said November. That to Really said that with me the other day. She was like, I just feel like November is time to cry. I was like, oh. <laughs> I love crying. I'm just saying. Just put it out there. I think crying is very therapeutic. It feels nice. It is nice. <laughs> it's nice. Sometimes you just need to watch a movie that makes you weep. For me a few years ago, that was Billy Elliot. Man, that movie really got me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> love that movie. I do think that that is why I watch the F word so much because it feels very melancholic mm. to me and like it doesn't make me cry, but it does make me feel very emotional. Yeah. And then I'm like, Emotions okay, I are got good. that out of my system. Yeah. had to face my feelings. Yeah, there you go. Um, all right. Well, did you have another book? Nope, no, that that's was last it. Time. I kept it pretty tight. We were gone for like two that. weeks and I only accumulated four books. <laughs> 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 Considering how many books I bought as Christmas presents, though, it's pretty impressive. I think I bought like yeah. 12 books for other people. So I did a good job. Well, you did much better than I did. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight. I accumulated eight books. That's and not too me... bad. If you went no, to five bookstores, I would have. I, I thought it was going to be a little bit more than that. So I'm no, impressed. it's not too bad. <laughs> Hokey dokey. As you mentioned, I went to five bookshops. This was on Saturday. You did it all um, in the same day? Yeah, all of them were oh on the my same God. day. So Connor, this is really fantastic. Connor has really started to lean into the mission with me. I think he wants me to accomplish my goal of I visiting all of the bookshops yeah, in Nova Scotia this year. And so every time that we're like 
thinking about going out he's like what if we hit up another bookshop and i'm like this is the energy that i (laughs) yes and so he asked like would you want to do some bookshops and i was like there are four bookshops (gasps) in dartmouth that we have to that i need to hit up yeah and they're all like within a few minutes driving of each other we could just do like all of the ones in dartmouth and he was like that's a great idea so we went to dartmouth which is um the city across the harbor from halifax right and yeah it's one of those situations where like if you come here it really does feel like it's that's just one big city Mm -hmm. halifax dartmouth it feels like it's one big city they're connected by multiple bridges and highways (laughs) but somehow they're two different cities okay and we went to dartmouth we had a really great lunch and then we got to book shopping what happened though is the right next and thank god right next to where we had lunch we had lunch at the canteen um if anyone is curious <laughs> but just next like right next door to it was a bookshop that was not on my list oh <laughs> and so we actually started there and it was called friction books Ooh, you got a tote and they bag. gave me a tote bag very nice which i appreciated because we got a lot we bought a bunch of but that was the shop um where we bought the most books and i really yeah, like the name so. too friction i know that's cool friction like fiction but friction like yeah I like, yeah that's that's good it's that's neat. good stuff it's an unusual it name neat. for a bookstore but i like it i liked it too this was one of my favorite bookshops that i've been to all year i really I love really that. loved it there was a couple of really cool things going on so first of all it isn't a full bookshop it oh. is in this cool little space Mm -hmm. that in the front third has a cafe in one of the other thirds is a record shop (gasps) and the other third is a bookshop oh that's cool that's cool vibe and i will post photos of these all on our website where i've been chronicling this whole adventure but basically it was really inspiring because it is hard to run a bookshop i understand that it's hard to run any shop yeah but you want bookshops in rural communities or smaller communities. It's funny because Dartmouth is not a, a small community. It's a city. <laughs> but it was really inspiring me to, to me to be like, yeah, you don't really need an entire bookshop, actually. Yeah. If you just have a couple of shelves with a great selection of books, that does what you want a bookshop to mm-hmm. do like almost all the way. You don't get the like, oh, I'm in a cozy bookshop thing. Yeah. But because this had a cafe and a record shop, it was a very cool spot. I will definitely go back there if i'm ever in dartmouth again i will super stop by because really the curation was insane i felt like every book i picked up was so interesting yeah um and then when i went to go pay i was like there was a a girl working there and i was like is this your bookshop and she's like no i'm just uh she was like i'm just an employee um and i was like not just an employee (laughs) Um, but she was like, but the the girl who owns the bookshop is like really cool. And I was like, nice. I can tell because I wanted to meet her. I was like, yeah. the, the curation was so, so cool. So I ended up getting two books. I got three books there, but one of them is a, is a present for Christmas. Oh. Um, but yeah, I got two books there. One of which was The Dog of the South by Charles Portis. Um, so cool. You guys might recognize that name because he wrote True Grit, which I read earlier this year and I won't shut up about because it's like (laughs) one of my new favorite books of all time. After reading that book, I was totally, I'm like totally convinced I definitely want to read more of Charles Portis's stuff. I just hadn't looked into which one I would read next. And then I encountered this one at the shop and I was so excited. Like I was so excited that it was Charles Portis. I was so excited that this cover matches my cover of True Grit. Mm -hmm. Um, they clearly have been reissued. But then I start reading the back and it says, The Dog of the South is the story of Ray Midge tracking down his wife, Norma, who has run off with her first husband. Um, Ray Midge is tracking them down by following credit card receipts, his own credit card that they stole. The trail leads from Arkansas down to Mexico and into Honduras. <gasps> and it goes on from there. And I was like... <laughs> It's, it's me. It's perfect. <laughs> it's Honduras. Like, I cannot emphasize enough how Honduras is never mentioned in anything. Yeah. And I was like, my man, Charles Portis, <laughs> gets it. wrote a book set in Honduras. <laughs> Woo! 
That's perfect. Uh, what I also love that that was at the store. Like, that feels like such a random thing to I stock. Know. True Grit wasn't there. Yeah, that's crazy. This is what I'm talking about. The, the owner of the store must really the like that book or something. Oh, God. I mean, it should... I, I don't know who this person is, but I love them. <laughs> um, and the other book that I got there was like, oh, my, this is so cool. It's called Kafka Was the Rage by Anatole Broyard. So this, um, I don't know, it's a slim little cute looking book. And I was like, that looks neat. Start flipping through it. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And <laughs> on the back, it, it, it says, what Hemingway's A Movable Feast did for Paris in the 1920s, this charming memoir does for Greenwich Village in the late 40s. Cool. So this is a little memoir similar to um, a movable feast. It's like a very short kind of very personal ex just account of mm -hmm. what it was like in the book and writer scene in Ooh, New York yeah. right after the war, like right after the war. And it start like the start of it, I, I kind of wanted to scream in the shop. I was like, this is the coolest <laughs> thing I've ever read. So it starts, I think there's a great nostalgia for life in New York City, especially in Greenwich Village in the period just after World War II. We were all so grateful to be there. It was like a reward for having fought the war. There was a sense of coming back to life, a terrific energy and curiosity, even a feeling of destiny arising out of the war that had just ended. The village, like New York City itself, had an immense beckoning sweetness. It was like Paris in the 20s, with the difference that it was our city. I mean... That's really cool. I'm feeling it. I'm <laughs> there with him. I'm yeah. in New York and I love it. And I, <laughs> I don't even care about New York that much. Yeah. Um, but it's all... Re so basically, Raylene, I started reading this last night because I was <laughs> like, I just want to flip through a few pages. And yeah. I'm like almost halfway through it. <laughs> and I am so I wish we weren't recording so I could be reading this. Nice. Huh? That's awesome. Um, it's so good. I I will say, I then looked up the author because I was curious what he looked like. Mm -hmm. I was like, is there photographs of Anatole? And the first, all of the stuff that came up about him was that after he passed away, his daughter found out that he had been passing as white, even though oh. both of his parents were black Americans. Oh, interesting. And so she's written a book about him Whoa. and his life. And so now I'm like, this is a memoir is all the way down. That's so cool. It's so interesting. So um, yeah, if anyone's read that, let me know if, if you enjoyed that book or if you thought it was good. Because now I'm like, maybe I'll just keep reading memoirs by these family members. <laughs> um, but yeah, really enjoying that. Really, really interesting. Awesome. So the next bookshop I went to was Strange Adventures Comics. You might remember this one. Yeah. I think I took you to this yeah. one, right? Yeah. It turns out they have a second location. Yeah, I was going to say, so, wait, what? <laughs> I know. They have Strange Adventures comics in Halifax and Strange Adventures comics in Dartmouth. Okay. The Dartmouth location is so much smaller mm. and it is truly a comic book store. Okay. They had one little shelf with graphic novels on it, but they a lot of them kind of skewed uh superhero -y or yeah. like that kind of genre so uh we were in there for only a little while because it was so crammed and we were looking around and we found a little shelf and i kind of like was able to in a minute or two just look at all the graphic yeah. novels and be like i don't see anything that i like um so yeah i definitely if you are a comic books fan this would be great to have mm -hmm. but I am not a comics book reader, so I did. I don't know. It wasn't really a bookshop. It was a comic book right. shop. Yeah. If at you least you me. checked it out. Yeah. So next up, we went to Tattle Tales. <laughs> Tattle Tales. They gave me a, a bookmark. It's a huge um, bookmark. <laughs> it's massive, but I'm not going to lie to you. She's thought of something very clever. The woman who runs Tattletales, I got to chat with her. She was the clerk. She was so friendly. I told her about my project. She told me about her shop. She's, I forget how long she said. It was 20 something years that Dang. she'd been running the shop. Um, and this, she was like, I realized that people often want to gift people books. Yeah. They don't want to write in the book. So she oh. designed this bookmark to have a lot of blank space. And the top of it says a book note with compliments. Oh, and then there's nice. space for you to write a message. I was like, that's a really nice idea, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. So anyhow, Tattletales is a children's bookshop. Oh. It was 
huge. I really expected it to be small. I don't know why, but it was massive. And there was a large section of toys, as you can imagine, yeah. and like stuff like that and um, puzzles and stuff like that. A lot of board books, a lot of picture books, a lot of chapter books. And there was a decent YA section. Like it was okay. a pretty robust YA section. So if you have kids and you live in the Dartmouth area, I think that this would be such a great shop to visit. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get, I have a friend who just told me that she's pregnant. And so I wanted to get her, I want my hat back yeah. by John Classen. I was Klassen. thinking about that. The moment you said children's bookstore, yep. I was like, John Classen. <laughs> John Classen. But they were sold out of it. Um, okay. And she said that they're always selling out of John Classen books, which I'm yeah. happy to hear. Rightfully so. She had also just had one copy of The Skull, <gasps> uh, the book we read by him this yeah. year. And she was like, I'm a little surprised that, we're giving this book to children. I was like, isn't it great? <laughs> She's it like, she, is. it's a little violent. I was like, yeah, 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 we like that. <laughs> so I didn't get anything in the shop either, but I did enjoy my time there. Okay. And then the next shop that we went to was called J.W. Dowell Books or Dual Books. I'm not okay. sure. This was such a strange experience. <laughs> okay. That's the only way I can put it. There was a lot of weird vibes going on in mm. this shop. Okay. So it all all over the door, it's okay, first of all, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Mm. It's its own building just kind of on the side of a highway oh, and weird. you're just like, okay, I guess this is it. And you you go up to it and all over the door there's multiple signs that say like you still need to wear a mask here if you want to come in you oh. need to wear a mask and it's like okay that, i mean that's fine it was just a little aggressive the yeah. way that the posters were saying it but oh i didn't have a mask connor didn't have a mask and we didn't have masks in the car we like walked oh, no. back and checked and we were like okay we don't have masks i was like god damn it like i really want to go to the shop we drove all yeah. the way here and it was kind of far it was really far away from everything yeah. so we'd driven like an extra 15 minutes to get there and I was like, okay, I feel like it's normal if a bookshop or any shop wants you to wear masks yeah, that they have, have masks, yeah. right? So I open the door and I peek my head in and I, I want to be respectful. So I didn't even step in. Yeah. I just like leaned <laughs> in a little bit and also kept the door open to like, in my head, I was like, this is airflow or something. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy that's working there, I think was JW Duel, Ooh. the guy who owns the shop. He's wearing a mask, of course. And I say, hi um we want to come in but we don't have masks do you got do you have any available mm -hmm. and he goes you don't have masks <laughs> and i was like no i'm sorry we don't have any and he was like you don't have any in your car i was <laughs> like no do you have them available yeah. or do you have them for sale like i'll buy a mask if you need me yeah. to buy a mask and he was like we only i only have a few left but <laughs> maybe you i'll give you some but you should buy a book. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> and I was like, I'm making a little deal with the devil here because what if I don't find a book that I yeah. like? But that instantly added a lot of pressure to the whole experience. Yeah, that's a I was like, now I have to browsing experience. I was like, now I have to find a book. So he gives us the masks. We put the masks in. Like I tell you, this was just like such a strange experience. Yeah. We we go in and he starts to kind of walk us around a little bit mm -hmm. and he was like so this is the second largest um used bookshop in canada whoa instantly my question is what's the first one yeah. what's number one but i was mm -hmm. like i can't ask that that's rude <laughs> so i was like mental note make a mental note i'll check that later yeah. it turns out it's russell books in montreal oh, okay. um yeah so now we know but um it's cool that it's the second biggest one and i didn't know that i was walking into this maze <laughs> And when I tell you that it was a maze, oh my God. I haven't been to a book that we, or a bookshop that was that labyrinthian in a really oh, long fun. time. I felt lost at certain moments. I didn't know where I was anymore. <laughs> didn't know if you're going to make it out. <laughs> All of the, okay, it, I don't, it didn't have heat. And mm. I then talked to somebody later on and they're like, yeah, they don't have heat. Like in January, all of the people that work there are wearing like hats and mittens. The bookstore like, that Julia and I used to work at was like that too. Like the heater, it was such a large building that even yes. though there were heaters, it couldn't keep it warm no matter what you did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that that must be what's happening because it was like really cold and it's only November. It's only the first yeah, week of November. It's it gonna was get cold icy. already. <laughs> But also, so many of the sections, the lights were off that I literally at one point 
turned my phone flashlight oh on to figure out what section I was That's in. scary. That's really scary. <laughs> it felt like I was in a movie or something. Like yeah. it felt really, really crazy. Um, there were some really wonderful details. The signs that said like poetry or literature, yeah. or those signs were like made out of wood and they were like fake books that were peeking oh, out cool. from the shelves. So that was really cool. And it really just had so many books. There was so much to look at. Yeah. And thankfully I did find some stuff to buy because I felt that I had made a social he would have like banned you from ever coming back i don't know what would have happened but it was kind of scary um and so i read the wheel of or i read i bought (laughs) the wheel of things by molly gillen Mm. um a biography of lucy maud montgomery so i was like very happy to add this to the uh to my lucy maud montgomery section Mm -hmm. and they had quite a few editions of this there which was fun because i like i really picked the best one nice (laughs) i felt so that was cool i also got um our village by mary mitford this one was mainly just like buying a pretty object Mm. like i see this more as this has what we're talking about no straight edges on the bottom four edge but yes on the top and it's blue that's cool that's cool now we know why that exists that's awesome (laughs) um yeah this was mainly just like buying a pretty object i'm I feel like it's so it's vignettes of this woman who was born in a small English village in 1787. She Mm. died in 1855. Um, But she did these vignettes, these little glimpses into what living in an English village was like at the time. I just thought that sounded really lovely. So I don't think I'll ever read this cover to cover but it would be something fun to dip into and i just thought it was really a beautiful book it is yeah and then the third book i bought again i think that i think that i was just feeling pressure (laughs) you're just like grab something grab anything because i'm like what is this what did i buy but i did buy it i bought constance fenimore wilson portrait of a lady novelist by anne boyd ryu um So this is a biography of this author, Constance Fenimore Wilson, who I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. And kind of on the first page of the biography, the author is like, this is a biography about a woman no one's ever heard Mm. of. At the time, she was a best-selling novelist. Everybody knew about her. But she's just one of those authors that this always happens, that just hasn't stood the test of time Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. She's fallen out of favor. And... um, Yeah, so she wrote a whole biography about her life and about her writing and about why her writing was interesting and stuff. Yeah. And I thought it sounded great. And on the back, it's like blurbed by the woman who wrote the uh, biography of Georgia O'Keeffe and the woman who wrote this other bio. And so like a lot of biography people seem to think this is great. And I was like, surely that's a good sign. If the biography community is... (laughs) A community that you're hoping to join. (laughs) Yeah, my my future community. Um, So I got kind of excited and, and picked this one up as well. So listen... If you have a mask, you should go to the <laughs> shop. If you don't, I, I don't know if you should. But I felt like it was such an experience. I would definitely, like, if I was on a date with someone, which will never happen again, <laughs> probably. But if I was on a date with someone, I might go to the shop because yeah. there's so much to see. And you could be wandering around there forever. Yeah, like, yeah. So it's many an sections and nooks and crannies and, like, weird little niche sections and stuff. So there was a lot to do and see. That's awesome. Um, but I don't know if I will make the trek out there again because it yeah. is kind of in the middle of nowhere. The books were not that marked down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you go to a used bookshop and the books are really cheap, you're like, okay, this is actually really worth it. Mm-hmm. They were cheaper because they're used, but they weren't like really cheap. So it was just a little like, You could okay, go to a different I'm, used bookstore. I could go to closer. Yeah, that's yeah. closer. Um, but I'm glad that I went for the experience because it really was an experience. <laughs> and then the final bookshop that I went to was the Dartmouth Book Exchange. Ooh. This was a really cool book. Great name, right? Yeah. Really good name. Um, this was a really lovely bookshop. Again, I got to meet the bookshop owner because she was the clerk that was there. And I bought a book there, but it's for my brother. So I can't talk about it Mm. because he edits this podcast. (laughs) So it's for Christmas. Um, and I got a little bag of tea because they sold like literary tea so i got I weathering heights s'mores <laughs> tea and Ooh. i don't know what s'mores have to do with weathering heights yeah. but it sounded really good Man, so i got some tea 
this was one of those used bookshops that like really focuses on mass market paperbacks mm. like a lot of romance a lot of crime they had a lot of western stuff like that so yeah i just didn't happen to find anything that spoke to me but there was a classic section that was cool there was interesting stuff mm. um and there's also an oprah's picks section which oh was yeah really quite interesting actually I was yeah like, i've been yeah, to bookstores that have that and it's like yeah there, I'm are, like, there are a lot of books that fit into that <laughs> truly anyway. yeah it's it's kind of fascinating um so yeah so those were the five bookshops that i went to and the books that i got at the shops amazing so do you know how many you have left to go to now like have you tallied it up okay this is really controversial <laughs> The other day, I was going to go to some shops and I was looking up where they are and I realized one of them had closed mm. years ago. And I was like, you know what? This is kind of goes with what I've been thinking. I don't think the list that I've been relying on yeah. is that reliable. Right. So I did some digging and I spent like an hour checking every single shop on the list. Yeah. And then like Google mapsing shops and stuff. And yeah. what happened was I discovered that a lot of the shops on my, not a lot, but a few of the uh, shops on my original list were fully closed, mm. permanently closed. But also there's been new shops that have come up in the last few years. <laughs> and so my original list was 34 bookshops yeah. long. My new list is 42 bookshops ah, long. Uh -oh. And I'm like, well, surely it's not fair that I have to visit all 42. <laughs> you because thought it was less. Because I was signing up to a different challenge, like a different amount yeah. of bookshop challenge. Um, and some of these are like, in the, like far away. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, no. Um, so I have now visited 19 wow. of 42, which is good. a lot. Yeah. But it's like that's not even half because I've jo I've added so many to the list. Yeah. Of the original 34, I visited 56%. So I'm over half. Yeah. I, mean, I think if you, in the end, are able to visit, say, like 75% of the ones that are still in existence, I think that's yeah. very solid. Like, I think that... It does feel like a big I feel like that it? is completing the goal, even though it's technically not. I also you know I mean? have several... I do have several plans. Like, there's a couple. There's four more in Halifax. I'm oh. like, how many are there? So I'm like, those <laughs> I'll definitely hit up. Yeah. Um, I have a reason to go to some of these different towns. And I'm going to, like, hit, ma mash it up with visiting shops. Nice. So I'm not giving hope... I'm uh, not giving up hope <laughs> on the list yet. I'm enjoying the hecticness of it all. I, I'm just going to keep plowing forward and seeing what happens. Yeah. And maybe just every day in December. <laughs> go to the new and I mean, that's really cool. Because like, just we're, if we're just talking about like our goals for the year in general, like, yeah. I still have goals that I have not reached and I might not reach, but we'll see. Yeah, so, but you we got to keep doing our trying. Best. We're just you doing gotta our best keep believing. Here. Yeah. What's funny too is like, this is actually quite an expensive goal. <laughs> yeah. Gas is so expensive now. Yes. And going to all of these shops, I'm like, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely given up. Like, originally, I had thought, I want to buy a book at every shop. Yeah. That doesn't always And, work. like, one of the first shops I went to, I just didn't find anything that I like. And I was like, yeah, actually, that's super true. I don't need to feel pressure to buy books yeah like that's yeah not the necessary. goal is to go to the stores not to the goal is keep to them alive go to the stores and yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um okay i do have two more books to haul okay and they but they just came in the mail this week mm. so this first one oh my god it's so cool it's virginia <gasps> wolf and vita sackville west love letters this is published by um vintage classics it's a like a vintage classics edition yeah Oh my god. It's so cool. I did read a bit of it yesterday when we were on our Patreon live show. Yeah. I so I I only made it to like page 12 or something. Um it's kind of small font. But anyhow, it's fantastic. These are letters spanning 20 years. Oh, I think man. it's 20 years between um these two authors, Virginia Woolf, who I obviously know a lot of like I've heard a lot about. But Vita Sackville West, I'm going to be honest, I don't know anything about yeah, her. Me either. So I'll be learning as I go along, I'm sure. But it's their correspondence, but also their diary entries, oh. and also a little spattering of just historical facts. So basically, like, 
it's it starts with um i think it's yeah okay it starts with an introduction which i skipped because <laughs> as per normal introductions it started spoiling stuff <laughs> um Get out of here. but yeah it starts with a a diary entry from virginia wolf in 1922 okay. she talks about going to a party and meeting the like meeting these people mm-hmm. like meeting vita sackville west and her husband and stuff and she gives um the, the, she says, the aristocratic manner, something like an actress's, no false shyness or modesty, makes me feel virgin, shy, and schoolgirlish. School Yet after dinner, I wrapped out opinions. She is a grenadier, hard, handsome, manly, inclined to double chin. I don't exactly know what that means, but <laughs> I love go. it, whatever but, it is. <laughs> whatever it is, I liked it. Um, so yeah, so she talks about meeting Vita Sackville West for the first time mm-hmm. and then she writes and then we have a letter from Vita Sackville West to her husband oh. and she says I just met Virginia Woolf she was incredible I love her I'm obsessed she's the coolest person I've ever met I want to be your friend <laughs> and then it goes back and then a letter from Virginia to uh, Vita Sackville and she's like um yeah it was nice meeting you but you can really tell that Virginia does not like Vita as much as Vita likes Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Also, at the time, and it's in one of the very early um, diary entries, Virginia West. Virginia West. Here, Whoa. I am confused, you know? Uh, yeah, here, Virginia's diary says, We had a surprise visit from the Nicholsons. And so, yeah, her last name, I guess, is Nicholson. Hmm. I don't know. I'm a little confused. But she's a pronounced sapphist. And May, and May thinks Ethel Sands have an eye on me old though I am. Mm. So basically they're going to have a love story. They have like this flirtation, this yeah. intense flirtation and um, romance that happens <laughs> over their lives. The and romance. I'm snooping. <laughs> I'm behind the scenes where I shouldn't be reading their letters. Yeah. That sounds so <laughs> juicy. You know, like a fun, it's fun so read. juicy. Yeah. Okay. The other one that I have is cheap old houses. Mm-hmm. By Elizabeth and Ethan Finkelstein. Uh, Oh, it says HDTV hosts and founders of Cheap Old Houses. So also, if you see a little Kleenex poking out, (laughs) it's because I lent this book to my mom and she got halfway through it and put a Kleenex in it. Oh, (laughs) boy. A a new Kleenex, I will add. (laughs) We've all done it. But yeah, so this is a beautiful book. Oh, Oh, wow. It's signed. They signed it. Whoa. Um, It's such a stunning book. And it's looking at all these different case studies of people who have bought cheap old houses. Just perfect for you. (laughs) um, And then restored them and brought them back to life and really put the time and energy into make like restoring them back to their former glory. Um, It's such a beautiful book. And what they do is such a beautiful project. Like I follow them on Instagram and they reached out and they're like, could we send you the book? And I was like, I would be honored for you to send me that book. Um, That would be really, really cool. My mom was like, you've got to be in the book. I was like, maybe in seven years when I finally finish this thing. (laughs) Please. That's cute. Um, But yeah, so I also got that one. Nice. Wow. Big journey. It was a big journey, really. And it was such a long weekend. It was just like the sa- that Saturday. It was the longest Saturday of my entire life. Because after that, we had dinner with a friend and then went out with them. And I, me and Connor on Sunday, we were like, what happened? What happened yesterday? And then the yeah. time changed and we we're like, I don't know. It's have- bamboozling for sure. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about what we read. Yeah. What did you read? Okay. Well, a uh, few weeks ago when we last did a reading update, I was reading this book and I've now finished it. And that is The Between by Tanana Reeve Dew. Tanana Reeve Dew was born in Tallahassee, Florida in 1966. In 2002, she won the American Book Award for her novel, The Living Blood, which is the second book in her African Immortals series. She is also known as a film historian with expertise in black horror and currently teaches a course at UCLA called The Sunken Place, Racism, Survival, and the Black Horror Aesthetic, which focuses on Jordan Peele's debut film, Get Out. This book. Um, I didn't love it, unfortunately, but oh, I'll okay. kind of briefly kind of walk you through why. And I feel like it's the type of book that upon a reread, I would like it more because oh. uh, basically it's about this man who is, I don't know how old he is, but like he's married, has a couple of children. And when he was a child, though, his he almost drowned and his grandma saved him. And oh. ever since then, he's kind of been like haunted by these strange dreams. And 
so there's a lot of like dream sequences in the book which isn't my favorite thing but as oh. the book progresses he starts to learn what they mean and why they're happening and once you understand what they mean and why they're happening it it really like makes them more interesting they're not just dreams like there's so much more going on kind of under the surface and yeah. so i feel like if i were to reread this book i would appreciate the dream sequences more whereas you know, I, I don't like them because I feel like most of the time you're reading about a dream and it's like, this isn't real. This has nothing to do with anything. Yeah. It's pointless. But in this book, they're not pointless. So I think okay. I'd be able to appreciate them more upon a reread. And I think if you're going to check out this book, which I do think is very much worth checking out, it's kind of like a modern classic in the horror genre, I would say. It came out in 1995, I think. And yeah, like it's definitely worth reading and just keep an open mind if you're not into dream mm. sequences because it is meaningful. But there's also a lot of other stuff going on in the book, like um, the main character and his wife are kind of going through some mar marital issues. So it's got kind mm. of like a family drama thing going on, but it's also supernatural horror um, kind of funky stuff. So yeah, I didn't love it, but it, it is a mm. good book. Like it's one of those books where I'm like, I know that this is this is worth reading and it's, you know, it's it's one of those books that has stuck around for a reason. Um, yeah. But after that, I started, mm. I can't remember if I talked about this before, but I read out by <gasps> Natsuo Kirino, which is a mashed potato book of mine. Natsuo Kirino is the pen name of Mariko Hashioka, who was born in Kanazawa, Japan in 1951. She started her writing career in 1984 when she started writing romance novels. This was not a popular genre in Japan, and she was more passionate about crime fiction and the psychology of crimes, so she switched her focus to the mystery genre in the early 90s. She has written over 20 novels, with only a handful of them being translated into the English language. This book took over a lot of my October, actually, <laughs> which yeah. is why, like, we... It's been two weeks since we last chatted but like this is all I've really been reading um I and think I, you talked about it I must then. have like I feel like I talked about the beginning because I I knew I, I said that I was gonna was, love it or something maybe it was in the end of the year book tag maybe you maybe. mentioned that it might have been that yeah but anyway yeah this is one that I have been meaning to read for years and I've put it on my October TBR I want to say for at least the past like three years or so like I keep wanting to read it and then not picking it up it is a little bit long it's like 540 pages long in the edition that I have so that could be part of it that was kind of scaring me but also I was just so excited to read it because I've yeah. heard so many good things about it and um Julia actually read it a few months ago and she was like, you've got to read this book. So I've had that in the back of my mind and I just finally decided to pick it up. And it was really good. Like I definitely oh, really God. enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so it's... It's about four women who all work together at this like boxed lunch factory. They work the night shift. So they're there from midnight until 530 in the morning. And they all kind of like they're sort of friends, but they're not super close or anything like that. But they, you know, they work together in this kind of hard environment. And so they've, they've definitely bonded in certain ways. And mm. the story really kicks off when one of the women shows up to work and she has a huge bruise on her stomach. Like they kind of see her stomach and are like, oh my God, what happened to you? And they find out that her husband like kind of attacked her. And, and so that was, you know, a, a dark moment at the beginning, but then she kills her husband after that too. Okay. She just is finally like, I'm fed up with this. I can't take it anymore. And she kills him. And then the the other women kind of realize that something is wrong and they kind of get it out of her somehow. And they're like, we'll help oh. you out. We'll get rid of the body. Don't even worry about it. And so oh. it starts this whole kind of dark path of like questions of like, what are you willing to do to like help your Ooh. friends? What are you willing to do to protect yourself? Like, what will you do in, uh, if, if you're put in a bad situation, what are you willing to do to survive yeah. kind of? And so it asks a lot of interesting questions and it's definitely a gruesome book. There's a lot okay. of kind of, I wouldn't even call it body horror, but lots of like body stuff going on because okay. it's very, it's very in depth about all that. Like it doesn't shy away from any of the the gross details so that's a warning for anybody who's not into that there's also sexual assault scenes so like stay away from mm. it if you're not if you can't take that but it was so so good though like it was yeah it was kind of slow at times like i found it to have kind of an up and down pace but what i also found really interesting is that early on in the book you're introduced to this totally random character there's this man that like runs a casino and he's kind of spooky but you don't know what he has to do with anything and then you don't see him for like 200 pages and so you're like mm. what what did that guy have to do with anything and it all kind of starts to weave together as the story progresses and it it all comes together in a really cool way um 
But yeah, overall, really, really enjoyed it. I will say the last like 15 pages or so kind of were like, what the hell just happened? Why Why did that happen? Like it almost, I, I wouldn't say it ruined the book, but it did kind oh. of like take away from it in a certain way, like without That's spoiling anything. Yeah, like it just took a weird turn that felt not like how the characters should should be doing things. Like, I don't know, it just felt yeah. weird. So I just wanted to put that out there because it is kind of like, okay. huh, what? But overall, really good, really glad I finally read it. And I have another book by her that I want to read on my shelf, so... I don't know if I'll check so it out soon, it, but did it have a satisfying ending? Um, kind of. Like it oh. it comes to a satisfying place, but then it just has like a weird flavor to it. Like I don't know how else to put it. Like it just oh. is tinged with like, but why did it have to go in that direction? Like it's satisfying and then it's not. It's kind of like huh. it's both at the same time. But yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Cause hey. that makes me feel like yeah, I don't know. It, you have you like authors have so much responsibility right to you spend what 30 hours reading that book yeah. or whatever like you spend so much time with it if it ends poorly i guess i'm imagining like the scene in uh, silver linings playbook where he's like so pissed at the end of farewell to arms that he yeah. throws the book out the window <laughs> yeah. like it's kind of reasonable in some way i mean mm -hmm. that wasn't reasonable but like it's sort of understandable <laughs> because you spend so much time you you yeah. you are you are giving your attention and your brain to the author and saying like, mm -hmm. I'm respecting these characters so much that I am invested in them. Yeah. Like, I'm investing in them with you. And so if you let me down at the end, that's kind of brutal. Yeah. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. I'll tell you after what happens. I don't want to spoil it. When for did people, that book come out? 1997, I think. Okay, cool. Neat. Yes, yeah, another fun yeah. thing about like both of these books that are like set in the 90s, so like you don't really have cell phones going on and stuff. Yeah, 1997. Right. So, okay, cool. um and same with like Intensity, the book that I'm reading now, which I'll talk about in a bit. It's also came out in the 90s. So, it's like I kind of like that. It has a totally yeah. different vibe from reading modern books because it's like, okay, yeah, this is a horrific situation and we don't even have cell phones, so we can't even like <laughs> text each other or whatever. Help. Yikes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's cool. Um, all right. Well, I also read two books. The first one was Serious Concerns by Wendy Cope. Hmm. Wendy Cope is a British poet. She attended Oxford College and was a primary school teacher for 14 years and then became a full-time writer and critic for different magazines and newspapers and was even a judge for the Man Booker Prize in 2007. All of her main poetry collections have been published by Faber and Faber. Serious Concerns was published in 1992. Um, I, for some reason, ended up not including in the fact in her little bio that she also has the OBE, the Order of the British Empire. As oh. you know, I really want the Order of Nova Scotia. Um, <laughs> yeah. I agree with Nova Scotia that I don't deserve it yet, but <laughs> <laughs> I am putting it out there. Mm. Um, yeah, anyways, sh this was really cool. She is like a best-selling author, has won so many awards. Like she's very critically acclaimed. And this was on, uh, this is like, I would say definitely a modern classic. Like yeah. it's, this was published in 92. So it's still pretty recent, yeah. but it's definitely one of the ones that from the 90s is is called out more. I have a little stamp in it because mm. I bought this book in, uh, in Portugal, in one of the bookshops oh, cool. in Portugal that I went to. Um, this was very enjoyable. As you remember, I read The Orange out loud. Okay, I was going to ask about that. I was like, is this that book? <laughs> yes. And I remember you really liked I that one. I loved it. Um, and she just had a lot of... All of her poems are really, really fun. They're, they rhyme or they're silly or they're cute or... But not in like a diminutive way. But yeah. Just like in a... That was fun kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Um I'm trying to find one that I would read out as well, but there I've highlighted a couple of different ones. Oh, okay, let's see this one. Page 78, it's called Favorite. When they ask me, who's your favorite poet? I better not mention you, though you certainly are my favorite poet. And I like your poems too. Aww. <laughs> that is cute. I like that. <laughs> That's really, really cute. Um, so yeah, I didn't love it. Like, I, mm -hmm. this is not for for me personally. And that's the thing about poetry, just like music. It's just like, I don't know, it, you either connect with, you vibe with it or you don't. You yeah. just, like, what can you say, right? But I really, really, I enjoyed it a lot and it was funny. I, I chuckled quite a few times. Mm -hmm. She is like, and I feel like that's hard to do in poetry without it feeling stupid. Yeah. 
but she made me laugh quite a few times. I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. Um, I would definitely read another collection by Wendy Cope, but I'm not like racing out to read another one. Yeah. And then the other book I read, I'm excited to tell you about this one, is Letters to His Neighbor by Marcel Proust, translated by Lydia Davis. Marcel Proust was born in 1871 in Paris, the city where he spent most of his life. He was a novelist, critic, and essayist who is most well known for his novel in seven parts, In Search of Lost Time. Proust spent his life with chronic illness, especially afflicted by asthma, and so spent much of his life indoors working from bed. He died of pneumonia and other lung complications in 1922, but is considered one of the most important authors of our time. Lydia Davis is a writer and translator from Massachusetts. She has translated several classic novels from French, such as Swan's Way by Marcel Proust and Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, both of which were awarded the French American Foundation Translation Prize. Lydia Davis recently made headlines for announcing that her newest book, published October 2023, would not be available on Amazon. Hmm. So when I was uh, re researching Lydia Davis to write her info bit, yeah. uh, I saw, there were all of these recent articles from the last few months about how her newest book, who, that just came out last month, she's refusing to sell it on Amazon. Wow. Um, cool she's lead. boycotting Amazon, which is really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, so I recommend looking into that because it's fascinating. This... I loved. I loved. Yay. I really enjoyed. Again, though, I will say, it, it, this was not a 5 out of 5. This was like a 4.5. Oh, yeah. And a, a large part of that was just like the overall experience that I had with it was really, really lovely. Mm -hmm. I bought this because of Lena. So if you recall, when Lena was here, she pointed out 84 Charing Cross Road right. on my shelves and she was like, have you read that? And I said, not yet. And she said, you must read it. She really emphasized it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, I'll bring it up to my room. And I did. And I started flipping through it and I just totally fell for it, fell into it, loved it. Yeah. 10 out of 10. Then I messaged her and I'm like, Lena, I need more books like this. I can't <laughs> find them online. Like I keep finding novels that are like this, but I, mm. I want like nonfiction, like actual real letters. And she recommended me two books, this one oh, and yeah. the love letters between Virginia Woolf and Vita Perfect. Sackville West. So this one came in the mail a couple of days before the Virginia Woolf one. I ordered them at the same time, but uh, this one came first. And I just started flipping through it. And next thing I knew, I was like halfway through it. And I was like, okay, oh I'm just going to read this. And I also made a reading vlog all about reading this. I read it in two days and I just like did a big vlog for the patrons. So if you want to watch the vlog that is linked, uh, yeah, our Patreon is always linked in the show notes. But um, yeah, this was great. I love, guess who published it? Guess who published it? Uh, New Directions or Faber and Faber. Yep. <laughs> New Directions, <laughs> my fave buddies. Yes. Love those guys. Love them so much. Really beautiful book as well. Like the end papers are so high quality mm. and it's like cloth bound. Like it's just lovely. Yeah. So the actual book itself is beautiful. And there's photographs of the actual letters oh, themselves cool. in the book. And there's pictures of him and his neighbor that he's writing to. So it's 26 letters that he sent his neighbor. And I, so this is the main flaw in the book. Yeah. It is not a back and forth. It is only his letters to her. Right. And so it's a little bit of a letdown, like story wise, mm -hmm. because you are missing half of the story. Right. And in multiple of his letters, Raylene, he says, that letter was stunning. I That brought me back to life. It, I have never read a letter so good. Oh and I'm like, damn, I would have liked to read it too. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was still really interesting. And it's really funny because I don't know anything about Proust. <laughs> like he's one of these authors who's just like really famous and mm. really, really prestigious. But his books are very like intimidating. And so yeah. you don't read them unless you have to kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't read anything by him. I don't really know very much about him at all. And it's funny that this is where I've started with his writing. <laughs> so random. He's a really great writer, of course. And like so many of the passages were really cool. I really enjoyed the translation by Lydia Davis. It felt so wonderful and smooth. And mm -hmm. like it didn't, I wasn't thinking about Lydia Davis while I was reading it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It didn't feel like there was someone between me and Marcel. <laughs> um, 
But the fact that it wasn't in correspondence really illuminated it. And also, like, there wasn't that much of a plot. Like, yeah. 84 Chang Cross Road has a real plot, even mm-hmm. though it's, like, real life. It just has, like, a story is kind of yeah. built into yeah. it. But here, he's mainly just writing, like, kind of weird little updates. And the main topic is just asking for them to not make noise because he's <laughs> very sick. And so he's always in bed. And yeah. he's like, I just had a really bad attack. Do you think that you could not do noise tomorrow in the morning? Hopefully above my bedroom you could avoid. Yeah. because and, and it's just like a lot of like asking for the apartment to be quiet. <laughs> so this definitely was an enjoyable read. I'm glad I read it. And I'm glad that I'm now on this weird little letters track. Yeah. I'm reading letters. Have you discovered any other books that you've bought or were thinking of buying? Other than the love letters, yeah. the Virginia Woolf, not yet. Okay. Um, I do, but do, I did get letters to a young poet. Remember that one? Yeah, yeah. That's the, the one I hear about real, the most. So I also have that one. So I do have a couple on the docket, but um, yeah, this is a very interesting category. Actually, I lie. <laughs> I did buy one other one that's coming from England. Like I Ooh. had to find a used copy, blah, blah, blah. But it's a, it's a bind up of Orwell's letters. But well, it's kind of different perfect. because it's not like two people. It's not it's a just correspondence. A bunch of random letters. It's, it's just a bunch of his letters that okay. we've collected over. But I still thought that seemed cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to learn more about this genre. Yeah. Letters. Very nice. Hmm. All right. Well, everyone, we've come to the end of this big catch up episode. We didn't talk Lots about what we're reading. <gasps> You're right. <laughs> Take it back. We're not at the end at all, We're everyone. We're still going. Really? <laughs> what the hell are you reading? <laughs> okay, I'll make it quick because we have been here a long time. Um, yeah. But I'll start by talking about the book I already kind of teased, which is Intensity by Dean Koontz. So this yes. one, I, I was kind of hoping to finish it yesterday, but I still have a little bit to go. It didn't quite happen, but it is the type of book that you can just sit down and kind of blast through because... Mm. Well, let me just tell you what it's about. So the main character yeah. is this young woman named China Shepherd. She and she's just going to um, hang out with her friend and her parents at their large estate in the Napa Valley. Like they're just going to go hang out for the weekend, have a nice time, and then go back to college or whatever. And um, the two of them are both psychology students. They're both working on getting their masters in psychology. So they're two smart women. And mm. um, but the unfortunate thing is, there's this madman killer guy who from the very beginning of the book he has already decided once that girl shows up to hang out with her parents like that night i'm just gonna kill all of them like that's his goal is to break in and murder everyone in the house and um but the thing is he doesn't know that china is there too he does not know that she was coming with laura and so she's kind of an unknown factor and that is where the gotcha. plot lies so she is fun. she is it is so fun like it's really fast-paced, dark, twisted, and uh, China is a great main character because she is, like, a survivor. Like, she's been through a lot from her childhood, was, like, abusive and crazy, and so she's very smart, and, like, she thinks Mm. about everything she does, and she, like, is always thinking, like, 10 steps ahead, like, if I do this, this might happen. If I do this, this might happen. So she's, it's really fun to be in her head because she's not, Mm. like, a dumb main character. She's not, like, the typical type of, like, horror main character not main character usually the main characters are smart but you know what i mean like in horror a lot of times people are just like making bad decisions and it ends poorly for them but with this one she's really really thinking ahead and she basically the main driving um force behind the plot is that she finds out who he's probably going to kill next and she takes it upon herself Mm. to try and save that person and so she goes on this kind of crazy journey with him and it's it's just crazy like literally so much (laughs) is happening every single page there's like not a moment of of dullness <laughs> so, so you're saying intensity is very intense it's very very <laughs> intense like it really really is um and then i'm also listening to an audiobook right now for fairy tale by stephen king oh. because i realized i mean i still have to read three fantasy books by the end of the year if i'm going to complete my right. goal so this one just happened to come in it is like a 24 hour long audiobook and i'm about four Ooh. hours in so i've got a long ways to go and um so far it's okay i would say it's just fine the main character <laughs> is this 17 year old boy who kind of saves his this like old elderly man's he doesn't like save his life but he helps him out basically the old man falls off a ladder and this guy comes across him and is like hey i'll call you an ambulance and then people are like wow a local hero (laughs) but anyway so that's and now he's just kind of taking care of the old man and there's like something 
something going on, but I don't know what it is yet. And the fact that it's called fairy tale makes me think maybe this old man is, I don't know, from a, another world or something, but I have no idea what the book is actually about. So it's interesting to discover, but yeah, it's just cool fine so far. We'll see where it goes. Nice. All right. I am reading Kafka Was the Rage, which I hauled today. Yeah. I am about halfway through it, really enjoying it, underlining a lot with my <laughs> pencil. <laughs> Very good. Um, so yeah, we'll see where I get. I feel like I'm in the middle of like six different things, honestly. Mm, yeah. Because the last week has been so busy that I'm not really sure what I'm in the middle of. So yeah. basically we'll find out together <laughs> whenever we do our next we'll reading touch update, base next I'll time. tell you where I'm at. Very good. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. Reminder again, our bookmark subscription is currently open. Subscribe. It's a lot of fun. And you can also always just subscribe for the first one and then see if you like it and stay on or be like, oh, okay, I'm glad I tried it. But uh, you could always cancel. So yeah. maybe just give it a shot. Why not? <laughs> As they <laughs> say. Um, all right. We'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.